Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by my friend Jeff Davenport to teach us about the history of drum tuning. Jeff, welcome to the show. Hi there, Bart, and thank you very much for inviting me on the show. It's a real pleasure, and we're uh, we're across the ocean. I'm over in the UK, yes. and um, yeah, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here and be part of um, the Drum History Podcast. Oh, this is great. I've really enjoyed, uh, I mean, we've gotten, we've gotten to know each other over the last couple of weeks. Um, I've yeah, really lockdown. enjoyed <laughs> lockdown, man. We're in lockdown. Um, I've really enjoyed watching your, you have a video series on YouTube or a channel called drum tuning workshops. Yeah. Um, and you're on Instagram and we can chat about that all at the end, but you, you do some really cool stuff. Um, and great. I know that you work with Rob cook and you, you do, tuning um seminars i guess you would call it at the uh, chicago show yeah yeah uh, historically so i'm excited to learn the history of this and and one i just keep having the thought in my mind that sometimes i feel like like i almost equate it to like learning to drive where when yeah. you first started to drive <laughs> you're like you're constantly checking the speedometer you're constantly yeah. checking your mirrors you're checking gas what what like, everything is so like but then the more you do it you're just like you're just doing things without even thinking. Yeah. And I'm sure that's how you get to with a level of tuning yeah. where you're just bam, bam, bam. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. And yeah, the musical equivalent of that is knowing your instrument. Um, and, True. It all, and it always used to amaze me. Um, uh, when I was teaching drums, I taught drums for a bit. And um, when I, when I was teaching, I said to the, you know, the pupil at first meeting and say, Oh, have you any lessons on tuning? No, I never had any lessons on tuning. And they've been having lessons for four years, five years, and they've never even thought about how to drive the car. Um, <laughs> and I, I guess yeah, it, exactly. I guess it's important. I mean, we've got to keep it in perspective, you know. And you've yeah. got to play your drums. You've got to perform. You've got to play to the music. And so I yes. always make sure that the tuning and the setting up, you know, does come after, you know, learning a few grooves and playing along to stuff. Um, but knowing your instrument, so you know. If you're a guitarist, you tune up before you have your lesson. If you're a clarinet player, you set the reed. If you're a saxophonist, you'll do the same and so on and so forth. And timpani players obviously have to find a, the, the note of the drum that they're going to um, to play for the performance piece. And and so the drum kit, we, we're like, <laughs> we're last in the pile really um, because we've got the most complex like you say, going back to the variables, we've got the most complex instrument you could ever imagine. And we have this situation where we can't see what we're doing. You know, I always no. say if, if there was a drum head, which could change color with tension, we'd be, mm. you know, we'd be miles ahead, but we don't have that. Yeah. We can't see what we're doing. So we have to resort to our hands and we have to resort to our eyes and our ears. Um, and, um, and kind of piece it together. And, um, you know, teaching tuning is about sitting around uh, a table in a pub or a campfire or whatever. It's about, you know, it's verbatim. It's you talk about it and um, you demonstrate it. And it's not, you know, it's not something really that can be done very accurately through the medium of the computer. But we now have a it's, it's got much better. It's got much better. Now yeah, there's more yeah. knowledge kicking about. Well, I think knowledge is what kind of gets rid of that tabooness. So yeah. why don't you drop some knowledge on people <laughs> and perfect segue and and teach everyone um, really about the history of tuning because I'm fascinated by it. I know there's guts involved and oh my goodness, uh, different oh my goodness things. I mean, I'm I'm glad it's been a period of time where I've had time to think about it because I think we said this right at the beginning when we first talked that the history of tuning is the history of the drum. Um, yeah, exactly. And and I have to be really careful here because there are many, many hundreds of people who are better at describing the history of the drum than me. I mean, I'm a demonstrator sure. and we are all performers. And and looking back over pretty much the history of human beings, the drum being central to the gatherings, central to communities, central to people, you know, just existing on this earth. Um, I suddenly realized, oh my goodness, am I qualified for this? But I just thought, well, you know, let's just pick out a few things and look at, um, you know, drums being communication equipment and 
how do we make them? And so, you, yeah. you know, I, I've used, I tell you now, I'll just quickly tell you my sources because I think they're really important, um, you know, points of, of, of information for everybody to kind of, you know, throw everything in the pot. Um, so there's a book by James Blades called The Percussion Instruments and Their History. Now, James Blades was an eminent historian, but more importantly, a professional um, uh, orchestral percussionist. And he did hundreds and hundreds of British museum trips, trips to the British Museum to find out about stuff. And his book is, it's the, well, lo- I bought it in lockdown because it's the first time I've been able to find it under £100, this book. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those. <laughs> when you go to Bell Percussion in London, and they're the premium um, percussion hire place for London orchestras and you know, music in, in London, this book is on their desk, and it's for very good reason. Um, what's in there is is just unbelievable. Um, so that's a really good book to look for, James Blades, and all of his books, actually. Um, the Vienna Symphony Library, that's a fantastic resource, um, not only for... Um, um, you know, music and um, and all sorts of kind of interesting history of um, in, uh, orchestral instruments, but more importantly, it gives you a little bit of insight into the how the orchestra used drums. Uh, the British Museum has a website. The Royal Collection. We'll look at the Royal Collection in a minute, minute because it has one of the earliest kind of um, single point tuning mechanisms, i.e., one dial. <laughs> one knob, many tones, and a system for you know recording those tones. Um, there's a lot of history in timpani, um, and there's a lot of history in ke- kettle drums. And before that, they were called nakers. Um, they were put on horses, and before they were put on horses, there were drums were held by people, and somebody else played them. So the poor guy was carrying drums down the road. Oh God! But when you really go, yeah, when you really go back, you're looking at tribal drums, and you're looking at um, skins held on pegs, dried in the sun, yeah. and played over, you know, played over pits. Um, and then you're kind of, you know, we can go right back to, um, you know, sk- skin stretched over shells, tortoises, mm. turtle shells, oh. <laughs> shells. Man. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. We're, we're, you know, we really did use exactly what was to hand, um, you know, for communicating passion and, and and a feeling you know um and we also had um after that pretty much when we started to make clay um you know amphoras and, and cookery dishes and things like that we had clay clay pots um so funny enough i actually found an old drum in the shed which was exactly this it's a it's a clay pot with a with a stretched skin um and the Jeez. skin is the skin is made wet and then it's put on the clay pot and then it's dried and sometimes um, then, you know, these are tacked in the, the, the skins and sometimes they're, they're pulled on little bits of string or rope. And, um, hmm. you know, and they're, and they're kind of one hit wonders. You know, you've got very little control over them. <laughs> um, well, that was my, you know, that's my question yeah. with this is, is, so first off, what year, what century was the turtle stuff going <laughs> on? Well, we're talking kind of, but, you know, birth of man. You know, okay, talking, that's what I figured. That's yeah, we're talking thirty-seven thousand, forty thousand years ago. Um, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> ice age. They found drums. You know, from the ice age. You know, um, which are which are effectively you know skins over over um, over animal shells. And, mm, um, man, and. I think it's pretty. People probably yeah. know this. Uh, there's a, it, it comes up in a lot of episodes where drums were obviously used as a form of communication, sure, um, yeah. to tell people something. Yeah, yeah. and just so, having a good time. They love you know festivals, parties, yeah. a celebration, somebody's birthday, a birth of a, a of an a offspring. Uh, yeah, get the yeah. instruments out. Get the drums going. So, would you say then the first kind of tension? Would be the the stretching and drying in the sun kind of sure. thing to let it yeah, dry. Yeah, exactly okay. that. Not yeah, like you said, not not a lot of control there. Yeah, zero control almost, apart from you know obviously atmospheric conditions which send. It's like our own skin. We <laughs> we tend to relax yeah. in the sun. We tend to get quite um, uptight as humans, and when it gets a bit colder, 
and it's all to do definitely with, um, <laughs> it's all to do with the atmospheric conditions but we're, we're really we're really tied down by what's recorded in history we're, we're really tied down by what is written and what is um you know documented so um you know so we don't it's a bit like um you know i see people talking about zildjian symbols oh 1623 where are these 1623 symbols i want to see them and it's like <laughs> <laughs> that's they, true yeah they don't really exist you know it's um you know they're about the place um you know zildjian was a company it was making stuff but you know ultimately a lot of these things are consumables they, they come and they go so we're, we're down to what's been saved and what's been recorded so um i did a quick look at screws and um there's a lovely website called boltscience.com, boltscience.com. Mm. There's a guy in the UK, and he's an expert on screw threads. <laughs> I thought this That's was fantastic, cool. the pitch and what have you. And, you know, and he talks about um, 400 BC, uh, Architus of Tarantum uh, was, a, uh, was pretty much the founder of mechanics, and he was a contemporary of Plato and – He's credited often with, you know, the kind of invention of the screw um, in oil presses and juice presses, you know, to get um, olive oil and, and make wine. And, yeah. um, you know, you're looking at these kind of inventions, which kind of trigger, obviously, well, the whole thing, you know, because a lot of mechanics is tied to um, the Industrial Revolution and um, the, the need for um, – Often you'll find, you know, mechanical invention in in war items, and you know things to do with them, um, you know, military. Um, so it's quite nice to find oil presses and juice presses, and then obviously water, you know, bringing water along, and because you know screw is, the screw thread is 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 central to our understanding today of a kit. Um, yeah. And then I've obviously got Archimedes. And uh, he, uh, people talk about him being, the, the, you know, the founder, but he was actually just the first person that was kind of credited in history, you know, um, from, from, for hundreds of years. Uh, he was kind of, oh, he, Archimedes was the guy. And he was 288 BC to 212 BC. Um, and so he's, he's there as well. But we don't really see um, screws, you know, appearing. Uh, I've got a few notes here. That there was... Um, in 1405, there's a fellow called Conrad Kaiser who wrote a book called Belly Fortis, and it's a study of um, instruments of war. I can't wait to get this book. <laughs> it's going to be such a grim <laughs> read. Um, yeah. But he was, uh, you know, he was looking at, you know, he envisaged a crank on the screw. You know, he drew the crank. So it was something at uh -huh. the end to kind of turn the screw. And that was 1405. Give tension. I mean, that's... It's just kind of putting it all perspective is that screw and obviously and everything kind of it, it just is it embodies the able the ability to tighten things right Correct. to simplify yeah. it yeah, yeah. So you, and and for a drum um, you know what people wanted was uniformity across the drum head yes that was their main game was to get this drum head tension to a point where we could really you know take it to war and it would sound impressive and and scary and um <laughs> uh, yeah and, and exactly then you know the the screw thread was going to help us do this because other than that we were having to pull down on ropes on a dried skin and um you know and that as as we know the skin can break it can snap it can kind of you know shatter or whatever um so Definitely. This was going to be a great invention. And funny enough, as soon as you see that screw arrive in kind of written history, you see pictures as well to go along with it. So uh, 1514 is the earliest one I can find. And it's a picture, uh, Hans Bergmeier, the elder. <laughs> um, <laughs> I suggest now, Bart, that you add the elder to your name because I think that would just be I the think I will. Again. Bart van der Zee, the elder. <laughs> I think that would sound great. I'll say I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, the elder. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that'd be great. Anyway, he did yeah. a picture of musical instruments um, where he paints uh, a kettle drum, uh, a timpani, uh, with a single point uh, tension screws all around the hmm. edge. So that's 1514. Yeah, 50, yeah. I, I, wow. I thought that was that was um, James Blades writes about him, and that's okay. a that's a cool. really great um, image. Um, and then we also have um, around the same time, and I think he might have been influenced 
um, by Leonardo da Vinci, also envisaging, um, what does he write? He writes pretty much a single, a drum with cogs working by wheels and springs. Um, and I think that's, um, and he, he actually draws it as a plate, um, well, as, as a drum with, with, again, screws, screws on them. I can't find it. I can't. I can't see it. Maybe somebody's got it. But he also envisages. This is great. This is brilliant. Um, he also envisages a drum with a lever that um, that uh, changes the tension on the drum, which we have now. Which people <laughs> attempted in like the 30s, I think. I mean, that's that's I know, amazing. Yeah, and obviously the uh, Arbiter Auto Tune is a yes. is just a collar which which brings uh, brings the head. Uh, tensions the head sideways and weird thing it really does they're great drums uh but they they kind of have a choked sound um mm-hmm. but you know back then we're talking 15th century people were looking for a one hit snap fit you know <laughs> get it sorted still are <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> um a single uh a single quick fix to tuning drums they um they're really they were busting back then to make it easy uh, and i think that's brilliant i think that's you know, because when you look at the questions on forums and the questions I get at um, tuning help desks and workshops, they are identical to the questions these guys would have had back in the 16th century, 15th century. Exactly the same. Um, and when I write all the questions down on a on a on a sheet, I then show people uh, the sheet from previous gig. And uh, and they are exactly the same. Everybody's asking the same question. Everyone's got the same yeah. question. Wow. <laughs> and that, that's funny. That, that I've done probably, you know, when I'm working for EMD, I was probably doing, I've probably done about 20 of these. And I've got, I've saved the sheets and they're all the same question every, every show. Um, hmm. So throughout history, we've had the same problems, which is great because we're all in this together. Um, so the next, uh, the next picture I found um was a guy called Pretorius, and the the Vienna Symphony Library picks up on this actually, um, and he wrote a book of musical instruments called the Syntagma Musicum, and this is probably the only time you'll ever hear me speak Latin, Bart, um, and it's probably <laughs> the only time that Latin will be uttered on this show, so let's just, let's enjoy the moment. But he had, yes, he, he pictures um, kettle drums with single point tensions all around the drum, uh, and he also draws a key. Um, oh wow! A tuning key. Now I've got. We'll talk about keys. I've got a big, big thing about keys, and that I think most of them are completely inadequate for doing the job that we've got to do with them. Um, mm. But that's my own. That's my own personal kind of <laughs> beef. Um, but he, uh, Pretorius, wrote three volumes of books between 1640 and 1620, um, and he even pu- um, pictured a, a rope drum with a screw strainer, so a snare strainer. Which is, you know, a screw type. So you, you you twist it and it and it tensions the snare wires. Um, and that was on a soldier's drum. They call it a lance quenet drum. Because um, mm. all of this ties. What year towards, was? Oh, when was that, that? So that's between. Well, he pictured this drum between 1640 and 1620. Okay. He died in he died in 1621, and he was a composer gotcha. and a music theorist. Um, so. That's really interesting, you know. I mean, we were looking to make things simple back then, you know. Um, and I think the 16th century is really interesting in the sense that what you also have happening is you had, you know, a, a sudden boost of um, a demand. Um, you know, if you can imagine before that, you're looking at ceremony and uh, it was a lot, a lot of it was tribal. We got We got society really kind of, shaping up to what we know it today so you how now have in the 16th century uh, you know royal musicians happening you have this you know uh, the, the the gauge of your country was um you know the prowess of your country was gauged on your if you had kind of musicians sure and, and if they had access to you know the, these latest things called timpani and trumpets and things. you know they're expensive and they were a sign of wealth so you suddenly started to see well i guess they've always been around but here you suddenly start to see you know improvements in instruments linked to the guilds effectively i'm talking about the guilds which were um you know um royal 
um, music, you know, groups of musicians. And here we suddenly um, pick up, um, you know, the beatings of drums and mm. this, you know, what, how you flourish with a trumpet <laughs> at the end of a phrase. Yeah, sure. and, and, and you suddenly got this little, little, little closed shop also happening of secret society of sorts, if you like, of, of these musicians being very protective about their knowledge. Because um, when you look at what's written down um, about how you tune drums or even how you play drums, there's very little. And I'll give a quick shout out here. Um, we've never talked, um, but a guy called Ed Rifle, uh, Toronto Orchestra, wrote a fantastic um, treatise on the study of written um, music for timpani. Uh, and it's a brilliant read, and it goes back to Altenberg's book in 1795. And this this 1795 book was pretty much the first time you saw it, you know, a timpani player writing for timpani players, you know, in terms of drum yeah. history books. I sure. don't have a copy. Uh, I have 200, you know, different method and tutors in the garage, but I don't have that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the whole thing is linked, you know. Um, while you've got the guilds happening, um, happening in the royal courts within, you know, uh, Europe and, and England. You've also got the weights, W-A-I-T-S. You've got groups of musicians here um, that are all coming together and playing and um, they, they'll celebrate. Uh, these are kind of like your community musicians. And so you've got this little world here happening, which is, you know, where you might see a, tub, um, a tambour being played um, in one hand and a, and a whistle being played in the other one-handed um and this is kind of early mm. music um and you might find surnames associated with people who played drums so you know your surname might come up you know might be appropriately um named and um yeah so you've got you've got these two groups of people coming along which drive the the need for audibility with drums so you've you've got quite a lot happening uh, musically and because, uniformity like, like you said yeah. i mean obviously you want these groups of people to all sound similar and um i heard uh i did an episode which will be out by the time this episode is released but it's on the history of u.s military drumming um Wonderful. and i talked to his name's patrick jones and he said that uh, george washington note noted that he said the band sounds awful we need to get better <laughs> trained musicians yeah because it makes everyone it makes your country look bad to have guys <laughs> where the drums sound bad everything's just kind of well do you know what? not that, good that, that ties into the royal musicians and the, the, their job was pretty um pretty important to you know make the whole thing look damn fine <laughs> for dignitaries yeah. and and what have you and um i think um what 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 where those guys ended up is um in orchestras um hmm. because what we have now is we have the birth of composition we have um you know suddenly we've got more people on this planet we you know the societies are growing and we have the need for music and, and performance and suddenly we see the birth of the orchestra as we know it um and i think that's another driver for tuning you know um gadgets and the need for tension and to be able to yeah. change it and get it back um, <laughs> um so yeah, you'll really. see, yeah so you'll see you know late 17th century you'll suddenly see orchestras happening and you'll see you'll see these musicians heading to orchestras and um you know and suddenly the, the need for you know good sounds um but the weights they go back to 13th century the, the groups of mu local musicians go way back you know 1272 is the earliest record i have here in holland of they were called the alta capella and uh, mm. in France, they were called the Haute Musique. Uh, and Italy, they were called the Alta Musica. And these are groups of musicians that perform for, you know, you know, festivals and arrival of, you know, parties, weddings, you know. And they're real drivers, yeah. you know. They're, they're professional musicians. These these weights were, in, funnily enough, um, the, these groups of musicians were banned in the UK in 1835 with the Municipal Corporation Act. <laughs> they were cleared yeah. out. Yeah, because it was just... Oh, it was all cronyism. Basically, you could never join these bands, or you can you could never get anywhere in society because it was all sewn up, you know. Sure. And, yeah. Um, Eighteen thirty-five was a big change in the UK, 
um, mm. for for that. And funnily enough, around then, so it's interesting. I mean, we've got orchestras between kind of the late seventeenth, but it isn't until like the mid nineteenth century, like eighteen thirty seven, that I pick up my next story. I can't find much, you know, tuning kind of history between those points, other than you know you've got you've got kettle drums which are chord tension. So these are, you know, they, there might be some advancements in terms of pulling a counter hoop down rather than just the head. Uh, so the, the skin is fixed to a hoop and then the hoop is pulled. Um, because I, uh, this is really interesting, and this could almost be a, a subject of a show in itself, Bart, which is a fella called Cornelius Ward, who arrives, you know, early 1800s as a person, He's an inventor and a manufacturer, and um, he pretty much patents uh, a, a screw tuning device for a drum. Um, so this is 1837. Um, so this is just really after the, you know, the Industrial Revolution that happened in, in England and then across in, um, in Belgium and then spread eventually to America. Um, and this is where, you know, modern manufacturing techniques of manipulating metal um, become, you know, smaller. We can actually get things made smaller. You know, if you, Archimedes' screw back in the day was a huge, great wooden thing. <laughs> sure. um, yeah. But now we can turn and work metal. And I think the history of tuning is definitely tied to, well, it's absolutely tied to um, cost effectivity, um, usability. Um, and all, almost always in in mind of a musical outcome. How do we use this musically? Um, but Cornelius Ward, brilliant. And um, somebody last month has one of his drums um, and is on the Vintage Drum Forum. I can't wait to make contact with him. But one of these drums has turned up in the States. Um, and it's basically a snare drum with a series of J-hooks um, the tension the head. So the bottom head is was where the J is. And the hook comes all the way to the top. And lo and behold, there is a wing bolt. And there's four of them on this drum. And what's missing off the drum is what's in Cornelius's patent, which is a series of cords and um, and cogs and wheels, which allow the head to be um, tensioned um, via a, a central um, kind of cog, which you turn with your hand which will set the pitch. Um, <laughs> this is 1837. It's unbelievable. Uh, yeah, but, that's uh, pretty yeah. advanced. Yeah, so, and he applied this to um, kettle drums as well, eventually. Um, you can see it on the Royal Collection. The Royal Collection in one of the, uh, the Royal Ball Supper Room in Buckingham Palace in London is one of Cornelius's um, kettle drums. And you can see it. You just type in Royal Collection, type in Cornelius Ward, great old name, and lo and behold, there's mm. this drum fantastic so he describes four things in the in the patent you know that it's, it's about straining heads and also a quick release mechanism for for you know changing heads because so obviously you can just you know switch this um this handle down and you know, it releases sure. all, the, all the tension um bizarrely he thought a hole in the middle of the head made a better sound <laughs> oh, so that's odd yeah, even on a snare drum and even on a on a timpani, just cut a small hole in the middle of the head, um, so you could you know keep your sandwiches in there. And um, <laughs> like, how how big? I mean, well, I don't like- know. I don't know. It's not written down. Um, and uh, okay. also, he yeah, so he he thought that. But but when you actually consider it, when you put a hole in your bass drum, it really does mute the the tension across the head. And I think that's what. Yeah. It, yeah, and so it's pretty the, normal there on the you know, yeah. the resonant head than, than it is on the actual batter, batter. side. That yeah, yeah, that. I know. This is weird <laughs> that it's on the batter, yeah. It's like you keep, yeah. keep losing your stick. And uh, <laughs> But I, I always think of, um, when I see a hole in a drum, front bass drum head, I always think of Larry Mullen's kit um, and Larry Mullen and mm-hmm. U2. And I always think of that immense sound that he has on his bass drum, which is, um, I think, a P3, a Remo P3 as a batter and a, and a pinstripe on the front head with a hole cut out in the middle and the, and the, and the actual plies taped together. Um, and that's one of his kind of studio sounds. 
But I digress. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but holes, uh, the other thing that Cornelius Ward came up with his patent, so it was straining heads, hole in the middle of them, and also holes around the edge of the shell, um, so near near the bearing edge, so effectively vented um, a shell, which, which, which allowed the equilibrium of, of pressure between the outside and the inside of, of the actual membrane, the actual head itself, um, to balance pressure. Um, which I think is a really interesting thing because a lot of timpanis only had one hole at the bottom um, to allow that pressure to escape. Um, and this, he thought, great, I'm just going to put holes all the way around the edge and this is going to sound great. And he must have done some experiments. So we're talking 1837 yeah. here, but we're talking 1830, 1820s when he, he must have put all this together because the oh, patent yeah. itself is very well written. Um, very ahead of its it's ahead of its time to to be yeah well, thinking think, about that I, and, and understanding it yeah well I think he's taken uh, what um, Leonardo da Vinci um, was putting together and he's taken that and, and run with it and, and, and you know extended it somewhat um, and the other thing in the pattern is rods and screws so this is see this is the thing about tuning history is that it's only we can only really kind of go back to what was written down and what's documented and. Of course, you know, we're, sure. We're, we're really stuck. Um, and with all the secret societies, you know, the secrecy of of how things are done, because that, you know, that secrecy back in the royal court and maybe within the weights, um, that secrecy held on to your job. I mean, we, we are brilliant now at sharing information um, and sharing, you know, everything that we do because it does ultimately make us look good. It makes us feel good. Yeah. Um, sure. and a lot of our, we, we're not in that business of, we're not in, we're not in the business of making music. People that share the most, um, you know, they tend not to be, they tend to be like me, like, tend like salesmen. <laughs> and, uh, but then <laughs> exactly. your job relied on it. You know, there's no way I'm going to tell you how to do a parallel. Go and find out yourself. Um, yeah. That's your <laughs> livelihood. I mean, that, that makes sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. And when hmm. you look at the books, the books only really started, the books on, on drumming only really started, you know, last century. Um, there are very, of very few of them before that. Um, I mean, I know books are expensive to make and to write and what have you, but back then, you know, uh, but um, yeah, and tuning, you know, you can't really describe it. People do try and write it down. You see like, huge long answers on, on, on forums about how to tune a drum and it's like, oh my God, um, it just takes forever. <laughs> Yeah. But um, yeah, Cornelius, a genius, um, and I, I'm, I'm sure the subject of, of greater discovery because uh, uh, there's a guy who's just got one in the states, and um, he's looking for information for it. And I, I, I look forward to to speaking. But this, 18, sure, totally. this 1851 uh, picture of the kettle drum is awesome. It's laced with with wire and cogs and wheels and single point kind of tensioning. Um, but he also describes on that um, that patent, and I can't see it on the on the picture, but a, a revolving plate with um, with with notes written on, you know, you know, a scale. Um, so this is you know oh, quick auto tune <laughs> timpani. Yeah, so style. you can actually gauge it and know what you're clicking at. Because I guess before, I mean, you're really just kind of a you're you're tuning by ear with all of this, even when you're. Sure. You know, playing a turtle shell or whatever, you're, 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 yeah. pl- you're, you're using your ears to try and get a matched tone with other people. And, uh, oh my goodness. Yeah. Which, when you, the, yeah. The, I really feel for the, I mean, we have it, we have it hard, uh, but, um, it's not life or death whether our, our drum is in tune or out of tune, to be fair. No. Um, where it's a timpani totally. guy, a timpani player, as we, you know, as we know, they have to hit an A. And they have to hit a B, and they have to hit it with the right stick in the right place for the right duration, and they have to count sixty-eight bars of um, you know rest beforehand before it comes in. You know, it, it's it's yeah. it, that's why it is I'm, life or death. Yeah, that's why I'm not a timpani player. I would have exactly I'd be in the pub. I would be like, "Where's the timpani <laughs> player?" Yeah. Uh, no, I'd, I'd have lost interest ages ago. And um, Me so too. they're very very pernickety um, with their um, with their drum heads and with their and rightly so, you know, there's a separate, like a Remo, there's a separate area where there's just some guys who are dedicated oh, yeah. to, to making yeah. timpani, you know, and it's. Uh, and now I need to say, we love timpani players and they're all great people. <laughs> and, uh, and that, uh, 
they're all friends of ours as well, but they, yeah. they have a hard job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hats off, hats off. But um, yes, another. I was just going to make another parallel here actually, because you know my other my job, my full time job is working with theatre practitioners. You know, I'm actually I actually went to drama school to to learn uh, stage management when I left school, and I've worked in theatre and worked as a flyman and worked as a, a stage technician. And the parallels between this mechanism on Cornelius's ward, you know. Uh, kettle drum is very similar to what you would find in the theatre and also in sailing um, on ships. You know, so out of the industrial revolution, you know, we we are taking our knowledge of rope work um, and you know field drums, and we are we are now putting metal onto it, and making it and twisting it to our advantage. You know, um, mm-hmm. so I think there's many parallels in theatre and especially on boats. You know cogs little wheels little pulleys yeah um screw threads i'll just tighten that a bottle screw threads bottle threads um and i think there's some very very interesting kind of you know um, uh, similarities there there's some interesting i looked up for cornelius ward in america and there's some at the library of congress they hold some flutes um early 19th century flutes of cornelius ward so he he extended his um his work to to other instruments Man, what a what a guy! You know, what a what guy! A yeah, guy. <laughs> what a guy! What a shout out! So, you know, we we've come a long way. You know, you've come from turtle, you know, upturned turtles with dried on skins through, um, you know, drums in the fifteenth and sixteenth century with, you know, which are rope and screw uh, snare mechanisms, and we're right up to the the, the end of the nineteenth century now, and. And we're moving into this modern age where suddenly drums become so cheap and popular that we've got millions of people looking to try and manipulate them. <laughs> um, and none of them, and none of them have a gig. None of them have any musical mm. outlet whatsoever. They, you know, I mean, when I was teaching in the height of my teaching, I was um, teaching. If I worked a Saturday, I could be teaching up to a hundred pupils a week easily. Um, and I often thought, what am I doing? I'm earning good money here but what these guys are net half of these guys are never even see a band they're never going to be yeah, useful at school sure. but they do want to know how to make their drums so then we've got this demand you know that has just peaked um probably peaked about five years ago um it, there was so and actually i do remember this i was camping in scotland in 1998 and the the <laughs> the mayor of dundee renamed one Christmas, he renamed the, the town Drum D because wow. so many, they'd sold so many drum kits to so many people in Drum in, in Dundee that year. He decided to rename it, you know. So I, th- I think it peaked at the, you know, you know, the 2000s, 2005, what have you. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, interesting. It's a yeah. resurgence of, you know, like maybe in the 60s with Ringo and stuff. There's, there's those periods of, uh, oh and people goodness. are lucky now yeah. that they're just doing, it's just your standard tuning uh, tension rods in a you know a hoop, yeah. but um, yeah, yeah. And you know what? I, there are there are people more qualified than me to to kind of go through that immediate history. But what I did make a quick quick note on was um, some of the tech tuning kind of techniques. So in um, yeah, at the turn of the century, so eighteen ninety seven, there was a guy called Lyon. I don't know his first name, but he used two rings to sandwich. Um, different different sized rings to sandwich the skin and if he moved one ring uh, that would change pitch so he patented that in 1897 and then there was a guy a pair of sap and stewart system um, in 1899 they used a an inner tube like on a bike so again we're taking you know uh, hit you know michelin stuff <laughs> you know yeah. car, cars and, and bikes uh, um, um, uh, modifications and we're applying them to drums, um, and you basically you, uh, you hydraulically you could change the pitch of your drum. So they they patented Ooh. that. I thought that was hilarious. I'd love to see that. Yeah. Um, and then of course, um, and then this is where I hand over to somebody else. We have the beautiful people at Ludwig, um, who's who you know in nineteen eleven they patented a pedal operated um, timpani, um, which must have been an improvement on anything else before and. You know, so uh, 1918, a pedal and a cable, 1921 pedal with spring balance. And it just goes on. And that's when that's when suddenly 
I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> because when you when you look at it, it there's so many different kind of um, you know people you know having a go. You know even um, you know film stars you know coming up with um, Marlon Brando even painted some painted something. You know um, everybody's really? having a go at, at, at changing the world. You know you you make a good point, and uh, I always like to preface that it's it's because I've gotten some on some episodes people said oh you missed this and this. No one knows everything, and and, no, exactly. and this is almost just a discussion, it's, as opposed to being the full, undisputed history of tuning. <laughs> yeah. It's just a good discussion on it. Yeah. But I want to read this. I got actually very recently. I was um, talking with a guy named great friend of the show, Joe Meckler or Joey Boom, and um, mm-hmm. before we were even talking, he, we were talking about doing an episode about the different kinds of tension on drums, because yeah. not even how to tune them, but. Um, Obviously, like you got the tack, you know, tack yeah. on heads and all this stuff. He gave me a cool list, though. And this is something we can look forward to. People listening can hear this later. But uh, here's the, it's that's there's rope tension, wire truss, single tension, single point node slash single tension, direct thread slash tube lugs, <laughs> bloating inserts, internal tune. And, uh, and he, we were trying to get together a different person <laughs> to talk for each of those, but wow. Yeah. So you, you get the, it's just, but it, what I find interesting is that it's all trying to achieve the same thing is exactly you yeah. hit the damn drum. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. I, this is it. And I, I, this, I still maintain is you've got to have somebody on the other end of those sticks who can play the music. And, um, so whatever it does, is kind of secondary to then the performance. Um, I, I, you know, doing a lot of uh, trade shows, I was at NAM one year and a guy comes up to me and he goes, I'm doing a, uh, I'm doing my PhD in, in membranes. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, oh no. Cool. <laughs> and it's like <laughs> yeah. a fantastic thing. And, but I always think tuning for tuning sake is uh, a spiral vortex of unhappiness. I really do think yeah. that, you know, when you're just tuning, and somebody is tuning away and then they turn around to me and go, does that sound right? I, I know I go to them. I have no clue. You're not playing the music. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, not in context. Tuning. You're just tuning and you'll always be chasing your tail that way. Um, so I always push people away from that um, because ultimately, you know, it, the, what pays the money is the groove and the fact that you, you've, you're a nice person and you're hireable and, you fit in with yeah. the band and so on and so forth. There's so many much more important things. <laughs> than, yeah, absolutely. You know. Like playing but, but, the drums. Yeah. But as a subject, as a technical subject, it's very interesting. Yeah. We can go back through the history and we can look at it, but it's, um, um, but yeah, the different types, here's the thing, actually that ties into uh, 1952, uh, Len Hunt ran a shop in the, in London and uh, my good friend, Pete Woods at Potter's drums in, in Aldershot. Uh, oh, they, they're a 19th century company still going that fix up a lot of the royal and military drums and look after them. And Pete Woods is a, used to work for Len Hunt. But Len Hunt is, um, is down as inventing a screw mechanism which uh, adjusts a rope tensioning system <laughs> on, uh, on a military drum, which I think is brilliant. Wow. You know, so not only do we have all of those um, things that you just suggested, but we've got, we got hybrids. <laughs> yeah, where one yeah. one one system controls another system, you know, um, you know, because everybody's looking for. I mean, you've you've done the, you've talked to Herbie May from Rebo about the plastic head. Yeah. I mean, when when that came in, when the successful head came in, uh, that made it so much more easier for people like Ludwig and Slingland and everybody to sell their drums to the emerging market of people who just wanted to enjoy themselves playing drums. It became a recreation rather than a job. Um, and that's when, you know, the, the difficulties with, you know, working this, this, uh, these two heads, you can't get it any more harder. Uh, honestly, you've got two membranes, you've got a shell, um, you know, it's like, how do we get this thing to work? And that's, and that's what I've done on, yeah. on the, on the Instagram videos on, on, on uh, at drum tuning workshops, because there is a, there's a, there's a video on there on how to tension a snare drum in one and a half minutes. And that's yeah. fast. I feel like it's like an infomercial where it's like yeah. cooking an egg and in five minutes. <laughs> and you know what? I four minute really, abs. I wasn't really rushing, but you know, I, I spent time as um. This is interesting. I spent time as a sonar drum rep. I you know not only was um 
I interested in tuning. I was really interested in sonar drums and the guys at the local shop, um, Rattle and Drum in Derby, said, Jeff, yeah, you know so much about sonar. You should become the rep. And one day I did. And I went to Germany and I talked to Karl, Karl Heinz Menzel in the factory and and I talked, told him what I've been doing with tuning and just, you know, showing people. He says, well, tuning is simple. You just just do that. You just, you know, turn the screws and you have tension. <laughs> and I thought. Well, yeah, I mean, in, in yeah, theory. <laughs> yeah. I just thought, well, that's my kind of guiding light in a sense. It, yeah, keep it simple. You know, don't don't overcomplicate it. And the, so the fine tuning, I've not done a video on fine tuning. People talk about fine tuning and I've, I've not really found a, a quick way yet to do it. I will do it. Uh, but that uh, well, do, do you just, do you yeah. use do you use the um let's say like the dial tune or anything like that um mm. any of those systems that use like um you know I, yeah. I don't want to say science they use yeah they they they, they use, use num- another, yeah, tune so by there's, numbers um there's a Regal Tip product um which is a torque torque measuring thing and there's yeah. the, obviously the drum dial and there's i tune there's people who that's what i meant that's what yeah, I meant, yeah. Drum dial. yeah yeah the drum dial um i've um i don't personally use them um but i i do as a, if you're working backstage you're a drum tech yeah you got the band playing the snare drum fails you need to swap out snare drum you need to get the main drum back up and running or blah 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 um that can be a very handy tool um and I, I will always, always, I won't diss them because they all have a function. I think the drum dial is from the denim industry. It's from um, from the fabric industry for measuring tension on fabric. I think oh, that's where wow. that's come from. Uh, I believe. Cool. And um, I, 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 lo- I love it because people put me up against it, and and they say, right, <laughs> I want you to make this head even, and I'll do it. And then we, go, and then they put the dial on, and they go, oh, you did that. And I go, well, nice. yes, yeah, because man versus machine. Well, because we're better than the machine because I, we go back to that 17 muscles in your, in the palm of your hand and the 18 muscles in your forearm and you have a brain and the brain can, can measure uh, reverberation. It can remember rooms. It can remember floors. It can remember the drum. It can remember the head. It can put it all together. These are the variables we were talking about and it can yeah. put it all together and come out with an answer because it's a most immense computing machine. But again, if you tune mm. just with a dial, you're, you're painting by numbers. You'll only have a, these, these are guys that, um, you know, that kind of need to throw away, you know, use the force Luke. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like, you know, what is it? John Henry versus the machine kind of thing. And like old, uh, yeah. folklores, but, I mean, um, yeah, my 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 overall theory on tuning is to is to spend as little time on it as possible, uh, and buy the best equipment that you can, and um, obviously study it. You know, have a day where you're kind of thinking about sounds, but always use uh, music as a reference. Like, oh, like Phil Rudd on ACDC. How does he get that? Snare? Sure. And, or Bonham's four hundred two sound. And people do ask me to recreate sounds, and I can do it. I can say, oh, well, it's this, it's this head, and it's this drum, and it's at this tension. Off we go. Um, I've been asked to recreate Steve Gadd's sound like a million times in workshops, in shops. And everybody's, <laughs> everybody's very disappointed. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, because it's it's the way you play. It ain't, it, it, it's exactly. not necessarily the tuning, you know. And um, and that's, a, that's another little discovery. But um, I try and, you know, keep it, keep it happy, keep it, keep it positive, have a goal. Um, you know, it's a, ultimately we're just here to kind of share information and uh, nobody's right nobody's wrong all of that kind of stuff because otherwise you'll just you'll just tie yourself up in knots you know <laughs> no well i i get i fall into that um and i need to just get out of it i fall into that category of don't touch it it sounds good you know what yeah, i mean yeah. like like if you touch my if you move a t- like a tension rod i'll never be able to get it back um, which oh, I need yeah. to get away from. Well, look, the, the more that you do it, you'll see the activity that I bring to a drum. You'll see that I do lots and lots of movements in a very short space of time. Um, yeah. And I'm that kind of guy because um, you can always get it back. Um, it's a bit, yeah. I, the guys that just tippy tappy and just do one movement every now and then, ah, you, yeah, you're in trouble. You've got to kind of, you've got to pour yourself over it. Um, and, 
And then, and then you give yourself the confidence. It's all about muscle memory. You're training your hands. I mean, I use my left hand, um, my non-dominant hand to actually tune uh, the best because it's, for me, it's the most sensitive. It goes towards my right side of my brain. It's got um, my spatial awareness, you know, um, tied in with it. Um, so use your left hand, um, make lots of movement, make lots of adjustment. Remember what those adjustments are. Um, I've got a, a tuning triangle, which I, I talk about, which is sight, sound, and feel. It's like the fire triangle, but, you know, for, for tuning. And you put all three together, you have happy, successful tuning. You know, you can see the head, you can see the screws, uh, you can feel uh, the head, you can feel the screws and the counter hoop, and then um, obviously you can play it and you can um, – you can put all three things together. You'll you'll have happiness. Take one away, and you're compromised. Um, so I think the the tuning triangle is one of my big things. Is uh, you've got, it's also like head fit. Head fit is a three way deal. You know, we've been fighting with um, you know uh, tuning mechanisms for years, but they've all followed the same thing. You've got you've got a head which goes on the shell, and then you've got. Uh, the shell which goes, which has the, the fittings onto it, and then the fittings go back to the counter hoop. Um, and you've got mm. this, this, it goes round, and each one has to be correct. You know, good head fit um, is is very important, and it helps the tuning feel and it helps the tuning mechanism. Again, if you take one away, you have, you have a, a really tight fit on a head, like you take the Gretsch drums um, recently, where the, you know, the classic fit has kind of fixed a, a Gretsch drum problem on a 14. Uh, where the wrap suddenly starts scraping against the inside of the aluminium hoop on the head, you know, you've got an issue there and uh, you've got to deal with it. You know, and, um, it's again, one of the many variables. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, honestly, there's it's, so it's, many it's variables. <laughs> it's, it, let's it, just it really have is. someone else do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, this is why you have techs. Yeah. You have, you know, this is I mean, why you have techs. Nick, Nick yeah. Mason. I don't think Nick Mason has ever touched uh, one of his drums. Uh, well, he did tell me that. And, uh, how do you get on with tuning Nick? Uh, well, I don't really do it. I have somebody to do it for me. That's funny. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, he can. He can. For guys like us who can't afford that. Um, <laughs> now, as, as we kind of get close to the end here, I want to ask yeah. you, you mentioned that time after time, everyone has the same questions. Yes, that's right. Yeah, Why don't you. you maybe give us the top five questions that everyone always asks? Um, and you can kind of quickly give us a little answer and maybe you can kind of answer some I, things that I've people are thinking about. I should head, have but. I should have written I should have my sheets with me but I can tell you I can tell you um an easy one is sure uh, this is this is great I love it how do I get a good bass drum sound there you go <laughs> and it's like oh no good bass drum sound. what's good you know um <laughs> yeah and 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 but this is the kind of question you get so it's um that's that's so the answer is uh, whatever fits the music but obviously what I'll do is I'll then demonstrate like three different tunings on the bass drum, and then they let them decide where, which one's good. <laughs> um, yeah. I always think about tuning. This is probably the answer. That I always think about tuning being low, medium, or high. Very simply, um, low, medium, or high on a thin, medium, or thick drum head, which you can interpret as a diplomat, ambassador, or emperor. Put those three together against those other three, you, and and practice and and kind of get to grips with that idea, and you'll lead yourself down the world of different drum heads and the worlds of different tunings used by you know premium artists throughout the ages. So you'll look at Buddy's snare drum and you'll go, "Blimey, that's tight. That's a high tuning." Or you'll look at um, you know Bonham's tuning and you'll look, you know, you'll decide that it's a, another another tension. But you know, keep it simple. So low, medium, or high tension with a thin, medium, or thick head, and you'll guide your way through it. Um, another good one is um, how do I stop snare buzz? Snare buzz is a great, yeah. um, and unfortunately you can't. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, you uh, look at. I like it, snare. I mean. Yeah, I love it, snare it, buzz. It kind of, it ties your whole drum set together a little bit. You know what I mean? Like it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, classic, yeah. a classic non-snare buzz sound for a kit is um, Danny Carey's and Tool. I mean, that yeah. is one hell of a dry sounding. The, the latest recordings they've done is like bonkers dry. It's brilliant. Very true. Um, but equally, I always talk about Roland and um, developing instruments, um, electronic instruments, which actually dial snare buzz back in. Um, so um, <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. So you can get, I mean, the old guys back in the, you know, in the 20s and 
you know, the vaudeville and the silent movie days. And funnily enough, I still play silent movies with a pianist in London. And oh, cool. uh, they're great. They're great things to do. And they used to use things like handkerchiefs. They used to uh, snip away some of the wires. Um, oh, yeah. Tea it, towels, all can, the stuff. I mean, Yeah, yeah. You can tune away from the note, which is sympathetic, but you'll just be moving into another zone. So you're better off just trying to, you know, live with it. Uh, so yeah. snare bars. Um, uh, how do I get rid of pitch bend is another good one. My, my drums are pitch mm-hmm. bend. I've got a little video on pitch bend, which is great. It's funny because the drum that <laughs> the drum that I use is just a basic Yamaha one. Um, and it showed pitch bend really, really well. Um, I tried it on one of my high end sonars and I couldn't get the drum to pitch bend. <laughs> it was like so it's the drum yeah the drum would not let me do it it was it was really strange i had obviously the the batter head at a high tension and the uh, the resonant side at a low tension and it just wouldn't do it so i thought well I, well you know i couldn't demonstrate it but um pitch bend is a good one and i um, always have a a really hard time um with a f- with like floor toms yeah. without moon gel or anything on it floor toms always kind of drive me a little nuts like i can always i always yeah. have trouble with the floor tom it's very well, flappy and i've got a video coming up um which, which is effectively about resonant heads and how we're all meant to be playing ambassador clears the ambassador the ambassador clear came out in the mid 60s and soon as that happened you had drum manufacturers buying these things to put on their drums to sell them because it in, it basically sold, you know, their real estate. They could sell, went up by 100%. <laughs> you know, they're yeah. just not selling what the inside of drums looked like as well as the outside. Sure. And um, and for me, it was the, the biggest, oh, it's, it's a real pain because we can manipulate the bottom head so easily, either with, you know, uh, God forbid, tape. But you can, you can, for me, I tend to weight up my bottom heads. Um, with a P3 or even an um, an Emperor Clear, or or I've got one drum which you'd love. You'd love this. It's an Emperor on the top and a P4 on the bottom, and oh, wow. it sounds enormous. But I'm a single stroke kind of guy, you know. <laughs> I don't play yeah. doubles. I'm just like a one hit wonder. It suits me down to the <laughs> ground, you know. Um, but you know, check out the videos because they kind of um, the twin ply top and bottom video that I've got coming up is is just wonderful because it's it's kind of got that sound which is so easy to manipulate it's already it's pre-eq'd and this is what you can do with with drum heads is you can eq before it gets to the microphone with the correct drum head you you know if you've just got a job in mind and you it's you and you don't mind where the tension's at um you can really eq your head um so I've, i've got friends who've who've shown me you know, uh, I've got a mate who played a skin tone over an emperor, uh, emperor um, snare side on a on an acrylite. So this is an eight <laughs> mil head, uh, mil being thousands of an inch over a five right. mil head uh, on a, on an acrylite, and he plays big band. Jason, thank you very much. And um, <laughs> it's it's brilliant. It's the most wonderful sound. And then he puts his wallet on top, and bang, off he goes. He's got his sound. So uh, we. I try and encourage people to be adventurous with their, their head choices, um, you know, you and their tensions, you know. They, don't forget yeah. the bottom head. You know, the bottom head is where it's at. But, yeah, pitch bend and floor toms. Yeah, floor is a big old drum and floor tom. It's a long way from the top to the bottom. The, the sound slows down, if you like. The energy um, has longer to kind of hang around. It's, it's a really tricky job. I have done some floor tom videos. And, um, well, yeah. I think, um, I think like you just said, is it's, it's, it's like, ugh, part of me is like, yes, you got to experiment with different heads, but I know heads aren't cheap. You play them for six months or whatever. Sure. And then you're like, do I buy something now that I'm like <laughs> going to experiment with and get something yeah. totally different? But, but it, it is important to do that. I mean, to it's, get something different. It's, it's really interesting. I do talk to people at trade shows, um, where they say, well, it's really expensive, that Jeff. I says, oh, what are you getting out tonight? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're going out for a meal. Yeah, we're going to go out and we're going to do this. I'm going to get trolled. And are you going on holiday this year? Yeah, I'm going on holiday. Yeah, yeah. So, so how much is all that costing? Oh, it's going to cost about 1,500 quid. It's like, well, this head is 20, 20 quid. 
And, yeah. <laughs> and it and it's you know and and it won't you make wear a good out. point. I, well, I know, I know, I, I I've seen it, I've but seen I want to go drink some beers and <laughs> yeah, I know, <laughs> I do prioritize beer over heads. But when you look yes. at it, when you look at it, 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 it really is a, a level of importance. Is like right, I've got a gig coming up where I do need some. I need a sound, ma'am. I need a sound. And I've done that many times where I've set up kits for, for guys who then recorded with them that week and sent me an email saying that was brilliant. Thank you very much. They've got a job in hand. So again, yeah, only really um, make it, um, you know, prioritize it with the music. Don't just, you know, obviously if you're rich, sure. you just want to change and swap about. But um, yeah, do make it. sure. Yeah. But do it, yeah, because, you know, when you look at how we spend our money, it's completely chaotic. Um, and I think oh, if yeah. people, people are that really – keen to get a good drum sound they should have a, a set of heads um, you should see the set of heads i've got um they should have a set of heads which m- helps them navigate the musical journey they're on um like some jazz heads and some some rock heads and you know put it very simply um and then true. Look, look at those look at those heads you know a low medium or high tension and they and you funnily enough you can find yourself you know with a with a great sound in seconds you know and hmm. the last video i've done is um, a multiple tom setup which is which is so funny it's just the loudest kit on the planet but that's cs dots top and bottom um, oh that's good yeah you can't imagine Love the those. loudest kit but the the kit i've got next coming up is uh, just emperor's top and bottom and you'll hear that and i, I know for a fact i'm going to get some emails which are going to go how do i get that sound <laughs> Well, then why don't we tell people as we wrap up here, where yeah. can they c- tell them where they can find your videos say the name again, all that stuff. Cause really you can see all this put into perspective and they're fast. Yep. <laughs> like they, they really give you a good yeah, quick I'm, example. I'm, I don't do any fine tuning, broad brush strokes and they're all at, at drum tuning workshops on Instagram. Uh, there's a YouTube page, which I kind of started, uh, which is drum tuning workshops again. These are the first videos I've ever done, and uh, they're great fun. They're quick. They're easy. They're not like, you know, I've seen videos on floor toms which last 16 minutes on one yeah. drum. I'm, I'm afraid my life is too short, and um, it was not, more important, it's not long enough. <laughs> you know, There just, you go. It's a good way yeah, to <laughs> just It doesn't need to be like that. And, um, and as a friend of mine used to say, that says, that's time you'll never get back, Jeff time you'll never mm. get back um that's true hopefully people don't feel like that after they listen to our uh, conversation <laughs> today, right <laughs> so uh, keep it simple yeah, move quickly no distractions no babies bot uh, no babies oh i, I no bot. yeah no yeah. comment <laughs> yeah <laughs> no babies in the way you have to kind of move quickly and just get to the bar as quickly as possible um, exactly <laughs> now i have a music space which is nice like i have a space you mm. know like in an old warehouse building where I can go and, and be as loud as I want. Cause I've learned that having this stuff at home, I just, I can't do it. I played for 20 minutes. I was going to try and record some stuff. And my yeah. wife was like, this is too loud. And I said, all right, I'm going, I'm leaving. I'm packing up everything <laughs> and going to the studio. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You've got to make space and um, yeah, but I'll, I'll hope to be um, on my holiday at, uh, in Chicago next year. And um, I'm planning on being at some shops in the UK again, um just doing you know open open days and uh but other than that i'm on if you want to email me drum tuning workshops at email.com just fire away you know you're quite welcome to get in touch that way drum tuning workshops at email not gmail email oh um, i was gonna say i, I think you said email instead of gmail and <laughs> that yeah, was right. yeah, yeah. it's a great site it's a great site and it was around cool right at the beginning and um yeah it's just cool. a conversation you know it's um and I really look forward to somebody, f- you know, putting um, more history into the pit, you know, um, sure, filling out, filling course. out the gaps. Because I, what I've just discovered on lockdown is is all available freely. I mean, uh, apart from the James Blade book. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more about the Cornelius Ward snare drum, because obviously that is, uh, you know, a real interesting piece. Um, and more about the guy, yeah. you know. Uh, so yeah if no, that's else fascinating wants to, and and yeah yeah and like you said that uh this will i'm sure i'll have other episodes down the line where it takes like i said it takes a deep dive into each different kind of tension and all that stuff and and sure. what what i've learned with a lot of these is is many of them uh 
like George Way is one person who has come up on, yes. I think, four different episodes where I feel like now, very finally, we have like his whole history kind of put together. And it took yeah. four different episodes where I say, <laughs> go check out this one and this one. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's often so it's the way I mean, thing. They, they're, they're so influential, but they're so tied to the, the needs of the current musician. And uh, all tuning technology is tied to the current needs, you know, and um, and often we don't need much. I mean, the system we have now is the hardest, but it's the most cost effective to make. So it's it's yeah. worth it's worth having a look at it. And obviously, the system for timpani players they only have one side uh, to to tune, but it, they have a more emphasis on the note they have to make. Um, yeah, they have sure. amazing the Adams setups are amazing. Um, you know what? You know the company Adams. Um, mm. so we're, we're about at the, uh, at the peak of our powers right now. And, um, but it, but we mustn't just forget, we've got these two hands here with loads of muscles and, you know, we can do it. It's, we don't need the machines. We can just learn, no. pl- apply it to the music. We're, we're better than the machines. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so. Jeff full. Hope so. Thank you. Uh, thank you for My taking pleasure. the time to come and talk with us and it's been a uh, pleasure to get to to know you over the last couple of weeks and uh, yeah. i look forward to hanging out at uh, chicago next year in 2021 and we'll all we'll all get together and have a have a beer all right nice one Bob. all right jeff thanks for being on the show all the best if you like this podcast find me on social media at drum history and please share rate and leave a review and let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.